We are back and we are on for our next panel, which is the art and science of banding wild falcons. Our panelists are Tom French and David Paulson from the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, Richard Nathors, Research Facilities Manager, Research Compliance, Research and Engagement from UMass Amherst, and Mass Wildlife Volunteers, Tom Scala and David and Ursula Goodane. So thank you so much for joining us and we're very excited to hear your presentations. Thank you. So yes, uh, Tom and I will kind of provide some commentary for the first half of this section, kind of the importance of banding, the art associated with it. And then um, we'll hear from two of our, I guess, super volunteers who've been really helping us up for a very long period of time and uh, helping us get the data that we have today. So to kick things off, you know, we often get the question of, wait a second here, technical difficulties. There we go. We often get the questions, well, why do we band? Well, it provides important information about dispersal, longevity, and recovery from injury. So we're getting incredible individual-based information um, throughout the life of the species and even the age. So we have um, one particular uh, adult male who's at the uh, Route 202 bridge in South Hadley, who is about 17 years old. And we know that it was he was banded in, in Vermont and is currently uh, residing there as the uh, dominant male at that site. And um, you know, as time goes on, you'll find these really these successor, these long-lived individuals, and uh, they always kind of surprise us how long they live, where they go, and um, create this history, individual history for the, the individual, but also the, the the family tree, if you will. So we use two different types of bands. We use a color band, which denotes region and a silver federal band as well. I often compare it to, you know, you know your license plate number, that's the color band, but you may not, may, may not actually know your VIN number, that number that's on your car unique to the vehicle. And ultimately, you know, those two numbers are critically important. And the whole idea is to be able to, to, be able to track these species over time. And the color bands, they're visible to the naked eye uh, or with a scope or a camera. And uh, we generally try to um, ban peregrine falcon chicks um, between the ages of three and five weeks of age. The reason for that is, is it's, it's, it's a good time that we can access the uh, nest box. Um, they're not, they're, they're mobile, but they're not, you know, a uh, flight risk, if you will. And we're able to get an accurate, accurate determination if they're a male or female by the size of their, of their, of their leg. And in a lot of ways, it's, um, you know, kind of like a puppy where the legs are really big when they're young and they kind of grow into the rest of their body. So at that age, in that window, they're the right age and size that the legs are almost fully grown. And we use two different size bands, one's for females because they're bigger and one's for male. So it's critically important for us to make sure that we use the right size um, band on the, on, the right, on the right sex. Um, Tom, do you have any thoughts on that as well? No, I think that uh, you, you've covered it. One of the things we have not done is use radio telemetry. And some, uh, um, there have been some studies using um, um, backpack um, harnesses to hold radios. And you certainly get a lot more data um, but it's a lot, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of technology uh, required and you've got to really need to catch the bird to take the equipment off when you're done with it. So um, the bands have served us well. And as I mentioned earlier on, and for some reason it didn't populate here, is we can create these family trees and we're working with some folks to try to actually create a database that allows us to uh, go back in time and track the, the, the family lineages, if you will. And, um, and that's gonna be a living database for, for all to see and, and know going forward. And um, you know, the, the beauty of the bands is they're meant to be seen, right? And we want observations to be had. And we, we work closely with the, the Federal Banding Lab and other states to interact. In fact, we recently had a, um, a fledgling that um, came out of a site in Newburyport that ended up spending time in Maine and was able to actually interact with the uh, Maine inland fisheries biologists there and um, since that point, we've been talking quite a bit about our various programs and what we're doing and how we can coordinate to really further the conservation of the species. And with these bands, you get some really unique information. Of course, the, uh, the female from Quebec and the, the band color there was an amazing find. And knowing that that individual is at UMass for a little bit and is still in, still in the valley and um, is still in the landscape, you know, successfully raising young is an amazing outcome. And, 
wouldn't be possible without that banning information. Here's another, here's another example. You know, we have, a, we have a chick that was banded at the Calvin Coolidge Bridge in Northampton. Um, it is now nesting in, in the Ubin Quarry. So it went from Western Mass to Eastern Mass. And photos like this are, are, are great, you know, um, you know, from the wildlife photography community, from the bird community, from the uh, local public. You know, like I said, it, it can be seen. The federal band, which is uh, basically silver, it's really hard to read unless you have it in the hand, but the color bands really quickly get you to, to um, what region it was in and, and possibly what site or um, um, location it was banded at. You know, and, and there's a, a lot of those stories, right? So you have, you know, um, birds that, or say in this case, hatched out at the customs house in Boston, moved to Worcester for a bit, and then, you know, it's been seen over the years hanging out on Plum Island. So you're getting this regional dispersal. And, and one of the things that Tom was so good about, and I, I've continued with, is when we get these observations, tracking, you know, where they were and what they were doing. And so when someone reaches out and asks about a particular nest site, we can say, well, here's all the chicks. This is where they went. Here are some unique occurrences and kind of sharing that information with the broader community. Similar to this one, you know, um, you know, seen, it was, you know, from Brockton, seen along the coastline. And this is really common. A lot of our, 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 our fledging birds in that first year will head to the coast before they kind of fully disperse into their, to, into their own territory. So, you know, once again, understanding the natural history, the life histories of these individuals is, is, is critical. And we get it from uh, banding observations. Another example, you know, getting that up-close information from UMass and then popping in in, in, in Wuben Quarry and getting those photos. And then, of course, the other element to this too is besides the banding is getting the documentation from the public and knowing when they're, when they're nesting, when they're mating, um, when there is hatch, all this fine scale data that otherwise Tom and I couldn't, couldn't get on our, on our own. This is probably one of my favorite stories um, called The Tale of Two Cities. And so we had a female that was banded in, in Providence, Rhode Island, and a male that was banded in Brockton. And, uh, you know, they were first seen on the coast. And then they um, came together in, in 2019 on the Palisades Cliffs in Alpine, New Jersey. So here's two birds that were hatched and fledged, maybe at most um, 45 minutes apart. And they're coming together and they've now taken up uh, residence of, of their own nest site here in uh, Alpine, New Jersey. So, you know, really cool information that we're able to share with the birding community and, and, and other, in other states. And you may ask yourself too, you know, besides falcons, the agency bans bald eagles, um, songbirds, shorebirds, and it's for the same purpose. So this next part is how you can get involved. So as I mentioned, volunteers are critical and, and you don't need to be an expert to get involved. There are a whole lot of sites that have Falcon cameras. UMass Amherst probably is the best camera, but there's a lot of sites that have um, cameras you, you can log into and watch right now. And in 2020, when everyone was kind of locked down, we had a lot of volunteers who just, who just watched for hours on end and give us fine skill information on hatch, food items, um, what's going on. And I actually had a volunteer from Mexico saying, hey, you know, I'm, and I'm kind of sitting at home like to do something, well, obviously you can't come to Massachusetts, but if you want to give us fine skill data, and she gave us a great report of the when she logged in, what she saw, and um, we have that. And then once again, that fine skill data that Archie Hager would have never been able to get all those years ago without having a camera. So just getting involved and connected is the simplest way to help out. In addition, you know, you'll hear from two of our really dedicated volunteers in a minute, but we have a whole list of sites on our website that you can view these, these locations from, from a public location, right? So I'll, I'll talk about, you know, Deerfield, Mount Sugarloaf. If, you, if you're there by River Road by the 116 bridge, you have a perfect view of that ledge site. Spending an hour, a few days, whatever you wanna do is, is great information. So give us a call, send us an email. Um, we definitely would like your help and support and uh, definitely thankful for all the volunteers that spend anywhere from five minutes to days on end giving us this fine scale information. Like I said, Tom's retired. Um, I now I now manage the program, and it's, it's just me. And honestly, we wouldn't be able to get to half of these sites if it wasn't for the volunteers. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind: how you can get engaged beyond today's conference. And finally, you know we are the rare species program, and managing the state's bio, natural biodiversity, particularly rare species. Um, you can support any and all rare observations through our website. 
and consider ways to uh, support the program and the conservation that we do statewide. So nearly all nest sites uh, have been identified by the public, particularly birders. And um, we have a few today that I'm really excited to give them time to share their story. Because uh, to me, their passion, their enthusiasm is, is infectious and hopefully um, helps you uh, grow as well in, in your interest with the, with the species. So the, the first um, presenter is David and Ursula Gerdine. So I'll let them un unmute themselves and um, I'll be controlling their slide deck. Well, good morning, everyone. For us. Um, my name is Ursula. I'm a falcoholic, and I'm a member of a 10 step program for a condition that has no known cure. Okay. Don't laugh. It's true. Right? Right. And I'd, I'd like to make a remark about that name. Uh, we were getting hands on birds in, in New Jersey that had come from Manhattan and had reported them to New York State. and uh, Barbara Lauchs, I believe, uh, at the time, she said, when we talked to her, she said, you guys are falcoholics. So it kind of stuck. So anyway. So that name And that's came the, from. the rest of its history. <laughs> it um, now, we first started getting interested in peregrine falcons uh, when our birding friends, David and, uh, and Michael and Barbara, um, invited us to join them to go to Manchester, New Hampshire in 2001. And that was the first year that Manchester actually had a pair that had four chicks. That box had been up there. I believe Chris had told, told us that it was up there for 10 years before um, a pair actually inhabited the box. We went up there. It was a, an invitation we would never refuse. And we were just enthralled with looking at the chicks. We could see them in the nest. And then they started to, and, we kept going there uh, as they did this process, and they were full said. And one of them, the last one, was the run, was the last one to fledge, and he couldn't get it straight. He kept crashing into different parts of the building. So we nicknamed him Crash. And little did we know when we were watching that young fledgling that he would become the dominant male in the Lawrence nest in 2003. Um, so we fast forward into 2003 and uh, I was looking on Mass Bird one time and there was a posting that said that there were nesting peregrine falcons in no directions, no spot where it was. And since I was born in Lawrence, we decided to take a trip and see if we could find them. Well, we were there a couple of times, couldn't see anything. Then one day we were coming down Merrimack Street and right on top of the Ideal Box Company was a, an air conditioner platform. platform. And sure enough, there was a peregrine falcon female with a couple of chicks. And we were watching them and a car drove up behind us and out walked Joe Hogan, who was a burning friend of ours. And he said, what are you doing here? And we said, <laughs> Well, we're watching peregrine falcons. He said, who told you? Well, no one told us. We just discovered them. We were looking for them. So I must, he I must, I must interject by saying when we first heard about them, they were on a mill building in Lawrence. If you're going to try to find mill buildings in Lawrence as a spot before we discovered them where they yeah, were. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> but at any rate, he swore us to secrecy. So that was 2003. Um, they were banded, Tom banded them. 2004, we went back looking at chicks, trying to figure out where, where Joe was, called him, no answer. The phone call was forwarded to his daughter. Apparently he had passed away and we didn't realize that. So we kind of took up the mantle that year. Tom did ban those chicks um, in 2004. And then what happened in 2005, they went missing. We couldn't find them. They were not at Ideal Box. We were searching, could not find them. And by some strange coincidence in 2005, Tom was called by someone in Lowell saying that a building was being renovated and there was a pair of peregrine falcons nesting there. And we weren't aware of it. We weren't connected with that nest site. And Tom did uh, band several chicks, I understand. And then in 2000, six that pair did uh, go missing. 
Now we're going back to Lawrence and we found the tricks that were missing in Lawrence. They were across the Merrimack River in a mill building and it was really tough to find them, but we did. Now this picture right here, you're going to see on the right hand side, you're going to see Javier, that's who, what we named, and his sister, Zelda. Zelda. <laughs> and she was terrific. What a bird. Anyway, so we were very excited to find them. And uh, they did quite well fledging. And so in 2007, we again tried to find uh, the pair in Lowell because Tom had called us. He knew that we were interested in the peregrines because we were there when they were banded in 2006. So he said, do you ever get up to Lowell? So we said, well, it's just Hop, the skip and a jump away. Sure, we'll go look. So we spent a couple of days doing that. And all of a sudden, Dave, you saw a peregrine falcon and fly. We, we actually were giving up after several hours. And all of a sudden, just as we were going to leave Lowell, we got a peregrine falcon flying over and landed on the top of Fox Hall. Uh, Which in, is part of the UMass dormitory. Yeah, and, uh, dormitory. And the rest is history as far as Fox Hall. She laid eggs on the top of Fox Hall that that season, but they were lost. Actually, the spring was very cold. And actually, it was a time when she was on nesting on eggs on the top of the building and she had snow on her back. Right. We so, had gone up there. Uh, we had made arrangements with security and the administration there to gain access. And Pat Huckery came with us. And of course, we opened the door and we saw her in that corner. But those, those chicks never hatched. But luckily, um, the Lowell campus was very cooperative and Tom was able to install a box up there. And it, it, it was just a hope for us. We were thrilled about that. So getting back to Lawrence, um, we found that, that there was a pair that uh, actually did um, nest there in Lawrence again. And uh, when we went to ban them, Tom looked at the two of the, the chicks that were there and they were males. And one of them was much larger than its brother. And so Tom banded them. And then when we were walking down to the car, the Memorial he said, Day weekend. yeah, he said, that that runt is not going to make it. He said, it's really emaciated that that bird is not going to make it. And I said, why? He said, well, because the older one is He's eating, is all, eating the all the food. So that year, as I said, Lowell had a new nest box. The pair actually did inhabit that box. So we left there with the idea that Tom was going to ban the chicks in Lowell. So we get up there to the roof. Unlawful. They opened the box in Lowell and the four eggs did not hatch. Everyone was so, so disappointed. And that so- That was the second yeah, year. Yeah, that was the second year that that female did not have chicks. So we, we left and we were very, very disappointed as the people were that were there. And so it was, as Dave said, it's Memorial Day weekend. So I just left messages on uh, Tom's phone and Pat's phone because I was so stricken by the fact that the runt wasn't going to make it. So I said, couldn't you just take the runt from, from Lawrence? It's going to die anyway and put it in Lowell because they had no chicks. Well, come Tuesday, didn't hear anything. And all of a sudden we got an email from Pat and she said, it's done. It's been done. They took the chick, the runt from uh, Lawrence and put it in Lowell. And we have made friends with uh, Jeff Bodwell, who was uh, the maintenance supervisor there at Lowell. And uh, he said, it was like, you should have been here. It was like a birthday party. There were feathers everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> this pair was so excited to have a chick that they fed that chick, it, it, they stuffed him. And it was quite evident weeks later when both chicks, the brother in Lawrence and the brother in Lowell actually fledged. Two and, days apart. Yeah, it was three days apart. Yeah, three yeah. days apart. And that was just a thrill for us because we didn't know if the parents in Lowell would actually take to that chick and they did. So, so it did show also how, how quickly that bird was stuffed and low because he caught up with his brother uh, and fledged only three days afterwards. But Dave and Ursula, we have, a, we have about four or so minutes left and, and I, I know you have a whole bunch of slides too. So as we go, just let me know uh, which slide you wanna be on and we can 
work through it. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is Air. Her, uh, she was uh, photographed by Phil Brown, and she she actually came from uh, Lawrence. We named her Air for the Air Mill building that she was uh, hatched from, and she actually went to um, Plum Island to hunt. And in the following uh, April, uh, Mike Lust from um, the ornithology class at uh, Green Mountain in Vermont, he Green actually Mountain. had a whole class there and they were watching this white-faced ibis. Then all of a sudden air settled down right next to the ibis and began attacking the ibis and actually took it out. She drowned it. And that was her meal. And that YouTube is up there. If you want to look peregrine falcon and ibis, there's a a YouTube that describes them and shows you the whole thing. This is uh, a picture on the yeah, on a, this actually in, is in crash. Line. Yeah, this crash. Uh, this is 2011. And uh, you can do the next picture, please. And then the next picture is uh, of him, Dave. Yeah, this is uh, him being attacked by a challenger in 2018. And which was very sad for us because the challenger actually won that battle. So it went from and 2003 he, to 2018. Yeah, and uh, he actually um, was found uh, wounded and was taken to Tufts uh, Clinic um, later, and where he died, unfortunately. So um, Crash was 17 years old, and he had 42 chicks that, that he we raised, know of, that we know of, because that one year he was missing, they probably had chicks now, we didn't know. So we took that very, very hard. So you can do the next one. Okay, so this is, we're going back to UMass Lowell now, and there were two uh, chicks that um, came from the 2010 nest. And this is Foxy, the other one was Splash, but Foxy was really very, um, feisty bird, and she ended up going to Providence. She challenged the Providence female in 2014, and she was there from 2014 all the way to 2018 when she herself was challenged, and uh, we don't know what happened to her, whether she just left the area or she was killed or wounded, we don't know. Um, now, this is Foxy. Um, we have a, a friend who was a, a, an artist, uh, Paul Donahue, and uh, he had painted peregrine falcons, but had never painted a, a, a juvenile. And uh, he asked Dave to send him some photos. So Dave sent him a photo of Foxy. And uh, Paul Donahue, yeah. Donahue really loved the, the picture so much. He did this painting. He and, did a line uh, drawing that yeah. he gave to us. And then he did this yeah, painting. Yeah, and this was the painting of Foxy. You can go next, please. OK, so um, moving on. <laughs> where um, this is uh, Toby. Uh, he actually came from the Tobin Bridge. Dave and I had looked for three years trying to find the pair at the Tobin Bridge. We saw the birds all the time, couldn't find the nest. In this one particular day, I saw a male peregrine carrying food and followed it and found it in, in the nest underneath the apex of the Tobin Bridge. I felt we felt that we had won the lottery. At any rate, there were four chicks that year and Tom could not actually ban them that year. Didn't have time to do it. So we had made friends with people from the Chelsea Yacht Club and we told them what to expect. They didn't know what a peregrine falcon was. We provided them with pictures, in, you know, uh, other uh, information and also gave them Tom French's um, phone number and environmental police in case they found one of the birds. Well, lo and behold, once one of the birds fledged, it was Toby, and he was found on the Chelsea uh, Yacht Club um, one boat, of the boats. one of the boats that was moored there. So um, this is John Texera. He, and if you um, look down, um, you'll see this is Toby here. On the bow of yeah, the boat. Yeah, on the bow of the boat. And uh, he actually... Uh, trapped the bird and called Tom. So Tom asked if we would go pick up the bird and meet him in Framingham. Now, which we did. Um, can you go to the picture that has Tom uh, back? No, back two more. That's, that's it. That's Toby right there. Toby was then banded uh, at the um, Sheridan Tower in Framingham. And we took him overnight and then we uh, released him actually in Lawrence because that particular year they only had one chick. So Tom thought it would be a great idea if we gave them another 
brother to uh, to foster, and, and that there was no way perfectly. for us to put her back. Yeah, we couldn't put back, her back back, back in, in the bridge. bridge. Yeah. So fast forward. Okay, one more. Okay. So three days after Toby was rescued and put uh, in Lawrence, um, a female had fledged, and she had actually landed on one of the boats as well. Again, Tom was called environmental police. John Texera of the environmental police, he caught the bird. And again, Tom set, can you just go back for a half a second? Go back, yeah. So um, Tom actually said, this time keep her overnight and I will meet you at the bridge and I'll ban the bird, which he did. Banded the bird and he didn't want to put her back up on the bridge. There was no really good There's place no to, to do, do it. it. So uh, the spot that we were at was the, um, Teamsters Local 25 Driving School. And Tom actually could get to the roof there. And this is Chelsea. I named it Chelsea after the Chelsea Yacht Club. I must you interject can see how angry she is. Before <laughs> that, I want to interject it for you birders and whatever. And Tom would know this too. You're not supposed to name wild creatures. But in our case, we always did because you can keep track of them. Trying to give them numbers yeah. was crazy. It was, so it was too high. For all you... Uh, uh, people don't be offended by the fact we're giving names to these birds. It's just for it's us. For our own consumption. But look okay. at that. Look at her face. Yeah, she's she not a happy so camper. <laughs> but the key to Chelsea is, just wait one second. The key to Chelsea is the fact that that fall, five months later, when she had, from when she hatched, she was captured in Assateague, Maryland by the Assateague uh, Peregrine Falcon Study. And they trapped... Uh, peregrine falcons there and took feathers, blood samples, blood samples, measured them, weighed them, and then they released them. And that particular year, um, she uh, was the only other, she was the only other bird that was banded. All the other falcons that they had captured were not banded. So the information did get back to Tom. So that's why we were so proud of her. And Tom did mention that she was the, the um, I think the farthest um, that that bird had flown, that he had banded at that time, that's probably changed now. No, okay, no. next, I'm sorry, I'm rushing. Anyway, so 2011, as we said, there were four chicks at the Tobin Bridge, we couldn't have them banded, but 2012, they nested again, and Tom made arrangements to have a snooper truck um, deliver him underneath the bridge to the nest. And there were three chicks that year and he did capture all three. And while he was capturing them, the female came so close to Tom, he grabbed her and he stuck her in a bag too. So he, the snooper truck delivered him over to the bridge where Norman Smith and Dave Paulson were waiting and they banded the chicks and the female and boy, was she mad. She was, she was livid. Anyway, back they go to Tom and they, they brought back to the nest. Now what happened, 30 more seconds. What happened was when they were replacing the chicks into the nest, one of the females got antsy. We don't know what happened. She fell 70 feet into the mystic river. We thought she was dead. Without flight but feathers. Luckily, and she had no flight feathers. <laughs> Three weeks old. But luckily this fellow, Jack, he was an environmental police officer and he actually rescued her and brought her up. And that's the picture of Jack actually rescuing her. So we did have her replaced. She was put back in the nest and she was the last one to fledge that year. She would have nothing to do with it. Anyway, so that's our little tales of, of some of the stories that we uh, have become involved with. Over the history of 20 years doing this, we have seen 185 chicks banded. And we're just, we're thrilled to do it and to be of some kind of help to mass fisheries and the wildlife to Tom French and now Dave Paulson. Yeah, and I, I might interject about Tom. Uh, Tom has banded over 500 chicks. So yeah, which is we, just you know, fabulous. He, he's Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. We're just carrying up the paint. That's all, Tom. Now, just one more thing I just want to add. In our experience, there are three categories when you're involved with peregrine falcons, the good, the bad, and the Lovely. ugly. <laughs> the good is when you have nests 
and you have hosts of people who welcome the birds on their properties. And then you have fledglings that actually can fly and have no trouble. The bad can be when you have a place where you know peregrine falcons are nesting and the administration wants nothing to do with it. They don't wanna have a box put there. And, and that's really, that's tough. And then if sometimes you have failed nests, like in Lawrence right now, we have no eggs in that nest. And that nest, the nest box was put up there in 2010 and we had hatched so many chicks from there and this year it's dead empty. So that is part of the bad, but the ugly is the ugliest part of it all. When you have a beautiful female chick, like the one we had in Lawrence last year, Sunny, she was the last to go. She was big, beautiful. And she was out on the perch, she was flapping her wings and this gust of wind came and took her and she tried to make it across the street to another building, but she hit a wire and yeah. she came down with a thud um, to the street and she was severely injured. We were able to capture we her, rescued but, her. Yeah, yeah, but unfortunately she was bleeding from her sear and her beak and we took her and we brought it to Tufts, but unfortunately during the in ride Grafton. there yep. in Grafton, yeah, she, she died. So that's the ugly, but you know, there are those three categories, but we do the best we can and we try to be of help to mass fisheries and wildlife. Well, thank and you, thank you, thank you for both. listening. Thank you both. <laughs> You're by far our two most active uh, volunteers in Eastern Massachusetts. And honestly, from giving us fine scale data to getting us access to these very challenging sites, we, we couldn't do it without you. On that same vein, I'd like to introduce Tom Salka, who is our kind of our, our, our champion Western Mass uh, monitor. And uh, Tom, once you're on, I will advance your slides for you. You got about ten minutes. Um, uh, I should be. I should be on. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. You're all set. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to share just a few of observations of the past couple of years. Uh, I started seeking out uh, peregrines in the wild. Uh, I guess about the winter of 2018 to 2019, I just wanted to start shooting, photographing peregrines. And I had the great fortune my first couple of times out to stumble upon uh, a couple of peregrines that were banded. So I turned those bands into David and that's kind of how I got started helping out Dave and Tom. Uh, one of my first photographs was of this lady right here, which you, you've already uh, talked about as 71 the uh, former resident female from, I believe, 2015 at, uh, uh, at UMass. And I stumbled upon her uh, in her new home around in the Holyoke Range. Uh, so this is one of the very first photographs I got of her. I probably took 200 shots of her sitting there. She didn't know I was there. Uh, she had been cacking up a storm is, what, is how I was able to get the, find her location. And about 30 minutes or 40 minutes after uh, I was photographing her, the male did come by. This was uh, j just prior to nesting season when they would start courting. Uh, Dave, you can, next slide. Just another image of her, had a little more, more of a calm moment. Uh, she's kind of become my favorite falcon. Uh, she, as, they, as was mentioned earlier, she's the one that was uh, fledged in Sorrel, Quebec. So, uh, and as, as Tom French mentioned earlier, she is, uh, you don't see this calm look on her face very often. She's uh, pretty tenacious towards us when we, we get involved with banning her chicks, but uh, another image of her. Okay, Dave. Uh, another view of hers. I got three or four of, of S71. Uh, she has kind of a very pale chest compared to many. So usually I can identify her even when she's flying uh, pretty well. Uh, this is again, a spot in the Holyoke range near, near where she nests. And one last close up. I, I like this photo. I was able to get pretty close to her or she got close to me. I, I didn't move. She just landed near me. But I don't know if Tom, if you want to interject anything about her beak and the tomial tooth or anything, you or David, if you want to interject anything, feel free. Not really, I, except that she is unusually white, um, pure white upper chest. Um, they vary quite a, quite a bit with having streaks in that chest, having it uh, sort of straw brown or yellowish brown. 
but she is very identifiable. Okay, Dan. Uh, I have a I have a slide sh a photo coming up shortly. Where I'll show you a picture of a female who is rather calm when we're banding. Uh, this is S seventy one when she's not too happy about us banding at her site. Uh, she uh, makes quite a few uh, runs on us, and last year Tom had uh, pulled out a stick to keep her from. Uh, hitting uh, one of our other guys that goes down and gets the, uh, the chicks to bring up to band them. Yeah, but, and, and, uh, Tom, and Tom to jump in, we've actually, since then, we've kind of evolved our, our use. So sticks are great, but obviously it's a, it's a solid structure. Thanks to Dave and Ursula and their patented use of a uh, swimming pool noodle. It's by far our best tool that <laughs> keeps them away and yeah, it's safe, safe like for the Falcons. <laughs> You, this is a that was a beautiful photograph for looking at her molt too. See the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh primary is brand new. The cover next to it is brand new, and then secondary is brand new. She's just started a molt. Uh, this is the uh, resident female from Mount Sugarloaf. It's taken last year. Uh, when we were banning her chicks, she made a few flights around and she, she of course, cacked a little bit, but she, uh, she would make a loop and land in a tree very close by and just kind of stared and watched what was going on. Uh, we, weren't, we wouldn't be that fortunate with S71. She's pretty busy on us. <laughs> but uh, this is the shot I got of the female. We were just kind of below her banding and she spent half, you know, half the time flying around a little bit and the other half the time she just perched in the tree and, and, and gave us the stare. And uh, yeah, and just to jump in on that site, we actually, we actually uh, it was our latest banding effort ever. So August third, she had three week old uh, chicks, which is uh, really unique and very unheard of. Yeah, I believe we thought that the first nest probably failed, yeah. and then uh, there were raven. They this was in a, a, a stick nest built by ravens, and. Uh, the ra there were act active ravens there that spring, but once they fledged and left, the the peregrine pair moved over from where I thought they were going to nest or where their nests failed, and they moved over and had their their uh, chicks in the in the raven nest. So I I, I threw this up here just because one of the things that fascinated me was was how fast they grow. So this is around that four weekish time frame. And next slide, please. And this is only about four weeks later, maybe five. And I was just, you know, initially, as I've, I've been learning more about them myself, I figured it would take a couple months to get to that phase. But this is a very, they grow so fast from the time we ban them and they're flying about four weeks later, five weeks later. Uh, uh, this is a female from another site I've been monitoring and I, I forget for how much I mentioned it earlier, but I pretty much try to cover all the natural sites or remote bridges in Western Mass for David. Uh, so I do a lot of traveling. <laughs> uh, and this is from a site uh, up on the Deerfield River. As Tom mentioned, they like to have their nests near water. And this is there's a particular bridge site that this female is on. I sat uh, for about 45 minutes one morning hoping the sunlight would get better, but it didn't. So I finally stepped out of the woods, she knew I was there. She'd been cacking the whole time. And then as soon as I stepped out to take a picture, she started flying at me. Uh, she wasn't that aggressive, but this is one of the images I got of her. Uh, I spend a fair amount of time going out in the winter to find, uh, find the adults, see what they're doing. Uh, initially, when I first started photographing and studying falcons, I initially thought that most of them you know, took off for the winter and came back in the spring. But uh, as Tom French and Dave will attest to, I believe at least in Western Mass inland, uh, I believe the vast majority of adults do hang around the area pretty close to their nest site. Uh, they may not, they're not on the actual nest, but they'll be in trees perched and so forth. So I try to go out at least a few times, uh, a couple of times a month from December through February just to see if they're still around. And, and from what I've seen, they, they do continue to stay relatively close to their nesting areas in the wintertime. And, and most of them 
uh, evidently do not head south or anywhere. I'm, I'm not sure if Tom would say on the on the coast if they would maybe maybe they would uh, migrate a little bit if they're near the ocean. I don't know. Tom, anything about that? Yeah, uh, no, I think um, our birds on the coast, my birds pretty much across the state are pretty stationary, but you go up into the White Mountains, the Green Mountains, the Adirondacks, and they all move down to the coast of Connecticut or even into uh, Virginia. Well, I believe this is my last slide. I took this one uh, just a couple of weeks ago. This is one of the peregrines for any of you watching that you, know, you may want the opportunity to go out and view peregrines. This is from the uh, a nest on the North End Bridge uh, over the Connecticut in Springfield. And what's nice about this spot is the nest is way out on a concrete pier. They have their favorite perch tree right by the, uh, the Springfield uh, River Club where the, I forget the actual name of the river. Uh, it's a little uh, rowing club on the east side of the Connecticut River uh, where, route, where the Route 20 North End Bridge comes over. You can drive right in there. There's a few picnic tables and they tend to fly back and forth from their nesting spot on the North End Bridge into this bare old dead tree. It's right by the picnic area. Uh, the, the, the people are paddling in there and, and canoeing and, and rowing all the time. So the peregrines are very used to people being around there. And you can get some pretty good views of them or photographs or uh, you don't even have to have a pair of binoculars. They're, they're flying back and forth all the time. So that's probably one of the easiest spots in Western Mass. If you're interested and want to get more of a close up view, uh, it's again, it's the uh, North End Bridge pair. And you just need to park in the uh, uh, the, the river, the, the paddling club uh, site on the east side of the uh, North End Bridge. Uh, lastly, uh, we uh, there's a couple of us, in, you know, that are doing most of the uh, nest searching and identifying chicks and so forth in Western Mass. And I know David loves to get more volunteers. So if anybody. Uh, Anybody else out there would like to volunteer? Western Mass is a pretty big place. Uh, I'm personally covering about eight or nine spots right now myself, but in the future, if anybody would like to be involved, uh, please contact David and uh, he'll probably hook you up with me and we can plan uh, places for you to visit and, and give us a hand. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak for a few moments. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. All right, so if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. We do have one right now, which is, um, do, what's the approximate ratio of male to female chicks that you see that you banned? Is it pretty even or is it kind of in favor of one thing or the other? Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty even. So um, at UMass yeah, on uh, the library tower, it's been 22 males and 21 females. So right at 50 50 but you will have years where it's not always that ratio like good example the the, the verizon tower in brockton that one year with the five chicks uh was four males one female but you know surprisingly over time it tends to even out pretty well oh yeah individual clutches can be four males or four females so individually you know it can be any number of combinations but on average it works out to 50 50. And then somebody else was wondering about how comfortable the bands are for the Falcons when you put them on them. Sure. Well, so the, it's like yeah. jewelry on people. I mean, if it fits well, it's comfortable. So we have to be real careful not to put a small male band on a female bird that's going to get too tight. Uh, but if it's, as long as it fits properly, you know, they'll go, you know, their entire 10, 12, 13 year lifespan with it not causing any trouble whatsoever. Yeah, and they're also lightweight. They're made out of uh, aluminum uh, aircraft, aluminum grade material. So very light, and they said they, they last they last forever. And um, and as far as we know, we haven't had any issues. And then somebody else was wondering, do you have any thoughts about how many chicks in Massachusetts might not be banded, like you know nests that you're not necessarily aware of? I think we probably have a, a number of nests in quarries, especially that we don't know about, um, and some in bridges that we don't know about. 
Um, there, you know, there's always new nests turning up and we've never gone and done a search deliberately of quarries. Um, but when we've been invited um, um, to look in quarries, I would say half of them probably have had peregrines in them. Uh, aggregate Industries uh, took us on a, a tour of about five quarries, I think, and we found them in three. Um, so I think we have some more, uh, and who knows how many quarries we have in this state, but it's probably 50 or more. Um, uh, and, you know, I don't know how many it, we're likely to have. I think probably 75 pair might be kind of the top. But every time I make a prediction like that, it, it gets, you know, um, exceeded. Right now we are, we're, you know, um, just under 50. Um, but I'll, I'll bet you there's, there could be as many as 10 that we don't know about right now in cores. Yeah, and just to add really quick to that point, uh, last year, Tom and one of our other, other volunteers took the task of just checking out some of the major bridges across the Connecticut River in the Springfield area. And in that one season, we discovered basically two other sites. And so any of the major rivers across, you know, the Merrimack, the Taunton, the, the Connecticut, all had, have big bridges, could very well be host sites for pelicans. And also the major cities, like right now, we have only one known pair in Worcester. It's hard to believe that Worcester only has one pair. And I think it's just a matter of ultimately people on the ground keeping an eye out. So I think um, in our major cities, and there's probably more than we can, we can definitely uh, think of, so. And I would say about half of the adults at nest are unbanded. So uh, when we get a chance to ban an adult, I, we do. Um, I think I've caught eight adult females that were aggressive enough to, to snatch. Uh, by hand and uh, ban them. That only tells us though, you know, how long that bird is gonna live from the day we banded it. Um, and when we have an exchange and it's been, that bird's been replaced, it doesn't give us any information on where it came from. So that's a little unfortunate, but, uh, but it's still better to have a, a bird banded um, later in life. So we know, you know, what happens to it after that. But Many of the surrounding states are not banding much anymore. New York, New York City does. Um, New Hampshire bans Manchester, and that's about it. Um, Rhode Island bans in, in Providence, and that's about it. Connecticut bans in Hartford. But there are a lot of uh, pairs that we know of um, surrounding states, and even some in Mass that uh, we, don't, we don't ban, and we know they have chicks. So we have actually a couple of questions about uh, the genders of the chicks. Um, someone wants to know, is the gender of chicks influenced by environmental factors? And another person wants to know, how do you identify whether they are male or female? Dave? Sure, so in terms of uh, in the hand, if you will, um, at the three to five week age, you can start to look at their, their legs. So um, females are generally bigger than males and their legs also kind of reflect that same sizing. And so we have two different size bands and the smaller ones are for male and the larger ones are for females. And we do a, initially a visual and a fit test. We basically, it should be a band that freely moves across the leg and, and doesn't get caught up and it is clear. And um, you know, occasionally you will have a large male and they'll get a female band, but more often than not, um, it's a pretty tried and true method to determine male versus female in the, in the hand at that age. Um, you know, and, you know, unlike a, say like a snake it's temperature dependent sex termination, uh, or a turtle, um, you know, there is ink, there's, there's genetics and they're of course being incubated by the, uh, parents. And then, uh, so do you band every chick that you're aware of? We've been banding every chick we can get access to. Um, there's some sites that are just really hard to get at. Um, there's some sites we couldn't get at unless uh, Department of Transportation provides access with an inspection truck to get under it, and that's hard to, to coordinate. Um, but we've gotten into some pretty dicey spots, uh, cliffs that are, have overhangs, um, bridges uh, with arches where we've had to strap a rope between the two um, the major supports at either end of the arch and then uh, rig a, a hook to hook under the bridge and go up the rope. And just, there's, there's some pretty interesting um, challenges that we've um, 
uh, we've successfully um, uh, got access to sites that weren't very accessible or didn't seem to be. Um, but, you know, especially now that we have so many of them and that they're not as endangered, uh, we're not um, putting extraordinary efforts into getting to sites that are hard to get at. You know, you know, with that being said, you know, we're, because we've built these relationships with with, with uh, building owners, bridge owners and, and, and alike, they 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 get excited about these banding events. Usually the community gets excited, it gets press and, and outreach and engagement. So, I mean, last year, even during the, the pandemic, we we're able to ban 40 chicks. And I think the year before we were close to 50, which is a incredible number compared to our, our neighboring state. So even though we don't get to all of them, we by far are probably the most productive um, and it's busy right now. We're just starting the banding season and we're going to be a busy two to three weeks. So it's a great time to be involved. And uh, I'm proud one this afternoon, right? Yep. Well, yeah, to, yep. Today at two o'clock. Um, so it's definitely something that people can watch and, and get engaged with. So we do have uh, a couple more questions. Um, are you aware of any peregrine falcons in Chicopee? So yes, the Route 202 bridge, which is half in Chicopee, half in South Hadley, on the South Hadley side, there is a pair there in a box. Um, Chicopee is another site where there's a lot of mill buildings and structures that could very well also house an, a, a second pair. But the, the Mueller Bridge is definitely the one we are aware of. And then um, someone else was wondering if you could just so there's the black and then there's the green numbers. Could you just go over quickly what um, what they mean, like what the color denotes? Uh, just uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, there are different color patterns for different regions. And so black over green means uh, banded as a chick in the Eastern United States. Upper Midwest has a different color combination. The Western US has a color combination. There's at least three color combinations in Canada, and there's another in Greenland. And we've had five Greenland birds that I can remember uh, that have um, uh, been injured or been captured for some reason or another in Massachusetts. So birds banded as chicks in Greenland that are coming down, migrating in October on their way to South America. The birds that are nest the farthest north, the Arctic birds, go all the way deep into South America, uh, whereas our birds don't go anywhere. So middle latitudes, they stay stationary year round, and higher latitudes, they fly over our birds and keep going south. Um, interestingly, uh, with Norm Smith of Mass Audubon, um, I trapped with him. He's a wonderful raptor uh, bander and trapper. We caught a, an adult female on Monomoy Island that was then captured at a nest site in Greenland later with our band on it. Um, but we didn't use the color band because that bird wasn't born here. Uh, so the, and we've run out of color and we've run out of numbers. So you saw earlier a black over red band. We started with black over red in the Eastern United States, used up all the possible combinations of numbers and letters. And we're uh, almost used up all the black over green now. Yeah, and I'll just jump in real quick. Um, in terms of uh, other sites in Chicopee, technically there's the Medina Street boat uh, ramp and launch in Chicopee near the Mass Pike Bridge over the Connecticut River. So that's another site that technically is in Chicopee that you can view from the uh, parking lot on, onto the bridge. And uh, so yeah, banding is, it changes all the time. So the, the color number combination will change. Well, the color is constant, but the number letter will, 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 will flip. So. Um, over time, we can track them and then they eventually uh, recycle. So, Lauren? So, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, someone was wondering when falcons try to take over um, a nest site that's already, you know, inhabited by another falcon, is it for the location? Is it competition for the female? Is it a show of force? Is it like a combination of all three of those? I, you know, some people even say that peregrines don't pair with each other. They are, they have faith, faith in the, um, um, in the nest site. Um, I think what the, um, there's a limiting factor for nest sites. And so I think the, the, the fighting or the battling, um, and the competition 
is over you know the, the the place to nest almost more than it is the mate itself but whoever wins wins everything they they win the territory they win the nest site they they win the, the mate the problem in, is in timing like so many other things in life timing is important if a, a female has already laid eggs and a new male comes in he doesn't care anything about those eggs they're not his and so he may try to harass the female to, to mate with her um, to the point that she uh, loses those eggs because he won't take over incubation of them. And uh, so a, a, a mate change, be it male or female, can be very disruptive. Um, and and the other, another thing is it's not always fighting. Sometimes we have these uh, nest helpers that come in. We have a third wheel or even we've had even four at uh, one site in Boston where four adult birds at one nest, uh, we had a dump clutch once. We had seven eggs in a nest where two different females laid uh, with one male. Um, and sometimes when you get these bigger clutches and more uh, moving parts with more adults, it gets uh, less likely that they'll succeed because there's just too much going on. Uh, but at the Christian Science Church Administration Building in Boston, that nest has been on there almost 30 years. I don't think we've ever had just two birds, two adults. It's always been three at least. Um, and uh, often, and these nest helpers, they'll help incubate, they'll help feed, um, but it's, uh, it's someone else's eggs. It's the original, you know, the, the resident bird's eggs. In, in um, Monarch Place in Springfield a couple of years ago, it was hilarious because the uh, intruder was a juvenile plumage female bigger than the resident adult female who just wanted to help and just wanted to incubate and would push the, the resident female off the nest with her own eggs to incubate these, these eggs. And the resident female out of frustration would came in and we have there's pictures of her sitting on top of the juvenile female incubating the adult on incubating the eggs. You know, so sort of stacked up, which is just bizarre. You know, no one ever heard of any of this stuff until we got cameras.